let's uh, let's move on and uh, welcome the next uh, speaker. Uh, as I said, uh, he's uh, one of the the headliner of the of the event. His name is Danny uh, Lofton. Uh, he's working for Telesat as a lead uh, system architect, lead architect story and system operations. Uh, obviously, uh, Telesat made the headlines recently, uh, announcing their uh, light speed constellation, uh, nearly 300 satellites in LEO. So this is right in the theme of this afternoon, talking about constellations, cyber uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, Donny, are you uh, with us? Can you uh, hear the, the studio? Yes, good afternoon. Excellent. Uh, great to, to have you. I don't know if you had the chance to uh, listen to the talk of uh, Greg Falco. Uh, he was uh, explaining uh, the vulnerabilities of satellite-to-satellite -satellite, uh, communications. I, I, is that part of the new constellation? Uh, yeah, so we do um, we do have inter-satellite links in our okay. light speed constellation, okay. and uh, I'm sure that uh, we could have many conversations about uh, <laughs> that particular yeah. feature and the risks around it, but also the rewards. Um, exactly. Today, I think I'll focus on uh, the op segment, which is more uh, on the Earth and less in the sky. Yeah, I was about to mention this is not the topic of your talk. Uh, I was just uh, making the the transition. Uh, yeah, you'll talk sure. about automation. This is also a huge topic. Um, so please, uh, uh, maybe uh, why, before I leave you, no pressure, uh, Donny, but uh, some people told me they bought the, their tickets just for your presentation. But uh, here you go. <laughs> okay, well, that's certainly no pressure. Thank you very much, <laughs> Matthew. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just dive right in. Um, and so, uh, Good afternoon, everyone in Davos. Uh, good morning for those of us uh, in, in other time zones and good evening as well. Um, as mentioned, my name is Donny Lawton. I uh, am the lead architect for system operations uh, for Telesat Lightspeed. And I'm here to talk to you today about vulnerability in automation systems for NGSO networks. Um, but before I do that, I did promise my marketing folks uh, that I would make a brief mention of our newly named and advertised uh, Constellation Telesat Lightspeed before getting to the fun stuff with security. So I do that quite quickly. Um, so Telesat Lightspeed, for those of you who are unaware, uh, is a global communication system designed to provide ubiquitous, high throughput, low latency, enterprise grade connectivity via a constellation of low earth orbiting satellites. Um, we've spent several years in the design development and technical risk reduction phase um, and we recently uh, selected the world leader in NGSO design and delivery Talos Alenia space to build our integrated network, including the state-of-the-art spacecraft and uh, the next generation technical operation systems on the ground. And I, I personally, I have to say this is truly exciting times, not just for Telsat, but I think for the industry in general. My entire career uh, in satellite has been focused on NGSO solutions um, as a payload designer at MDA, working on early NGSO payload systems to now an end-to-end -end NGSO system with Telesat. And it's absolutely a joy for me to see both new and existing players in the SATCOM space um, building these truly disruptive solutions and facilitating broader integration of satellite communications technology into our global network fabric. Now, of course, in the past, I think there was a benefit to being a kind of a corner of the network, a bit more obscure. Uh, if you don't carry as much traffic, you're less of a juicy target. And I'm sure that there's going to be some conversations about that at some point uh, during this conference and, and elsewhere. Um, but today, I want to focus on a particular passion of mine, which is the automation of network control. So let's get into it. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is weather. And I know what some of you might be thinking, Donnie, you're at the wrong conference. You clicked on the wrong Zoom link. Like, what are you doing? This is a security conference. But bear with me. In the next 20 or so minutes, uh, this will all make sense. So weather. It can be pretty awesome. You know, clear sky, no clouds, uh, a lot of fun to be out in. And it can also pretty much be pretty much suck. You know, thunderstorms, rain, all sorts of things. For satellite communications networks, weather is always the proverbial elephant in the room. Uh, so much so that there are pages and pages of documentation uh, at the ITU about how to model and manage weather effects on Earth-space radio frequency links. For all you non-RF folks out there, uh, oops, I think I went to slide quickly, there we go. For all you non-RF folks out there, the capacity of a wireless link is associated with its bandwidth in hertz and its signal to noise ratio measured in decibels. For a given bandwidth, the higher the signal to noise ratio, the higher the data rate. Now, of course, from the ITU, we learned that increases atmospheric uh, water or rain and clouds for the rest of us who are not meteorologists 
increase attenuation along a given propagation vector, and this leads to a reduction in SNR. So practically, I think, practically, I think all of us at a certain age have experienced this situation before. We're, you know, watching the big game on television, in my case, being from Canada, it's hockey, um, and we hear thunder in the distance. The signal starts to get choppy and eventually outage. And so what we do know, and I think from practical experience, is that in addition to just degrading the quality of a signal, um, if the SNR gets to low due to weather, the link doesn't close and no data flows, and we have the worst quality of experience possible. Now, over the past several decades, tired of missing these important championship moments, I think satellite communication engineers have invented pretty swanky methods to automate and address weather effects. At its most simple, um, if a channel fades and the signal reduces, if we have enough power at our terminal, we can just turn it up. And this is something that people call uplink or adaptive power control. Um, we also have more complex uh, mechanisms in the baseband to address this. Uh, things like, for example, adaptive coding and modulation, which automatically lowers and raises the modem set points um, in, in response to signal strength variation. We also have uh, something that some people call adaptive bandwidth assignment, dynamic rate adaptation, a bunch of different names. But essentially what we're doing is adjusting power spectral density by uh, reducing the effective bandwidth of the signal by keeping the same power level. Um, classically, these closed loop systems exist on a fixed geometry, a uh, consequence of being connected to a single satellite in geostationary orbit. As more complex SATCOM networks have appeared, you know, with more and more terminals using the same resource, uh, RF resources, but um, perhaps in more complex multiplexing and multiple access schemas, uh, these systems are still limited. They're still stuck on the same geometry connected to the same satellite along the same so-called link vector. So if weather intercepts that link vector, it's uh, largely unavoidable. Now, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction, tell us that light speed is an NGSO constellation. And I think we should first unpack those terms. So NGSO stands for non-geostationary orbit, uh, meaning that the spacecraft are in motion relative to the Earth's surface and appear to move across the sky. Second, a constellation is a collection of satellites working together to support a given mission. In the case of Telsat Lightspeed, the mission is to deliver low latency, high throughput connectivity all over the planet. Now, these two aspects of the Lightspeed system yield some relevant system features that we can leverage. First, at a given location on the Earth's surface, there are several constellation spacecraft in the field of view um, with the potential to support different link vectors, right? So I can go a completely different azimuthal direction as well as elevation. Second, those spacecrafts are moving relative to the Earth's surface. And so the link factors are natively changing and dynamic. Um, so that means that we already have systems in place to manage dynamicism of geometry in our, uh, by, by, the, by virtue of the constellation um, being non-geostationary. For every light speed terminal on the planet, the light speed network selects which satellite will serve it. And this is an automated system uh, that I work on called the System Resource Manager. So, what does the system resource manager do? It builds a global view of the forecasted quality of every link vector available to every light speed terminal at every point in time, and then proactively instructs the terminals to connect to specific satellites for specific intervals, such that all the services in the system are maintained. At Telesat, we call the process of terminal to satellite assignment, satellite resource assignment. Now, if you're a software engineer, you're probably thinking that's awesome. Uh, what kind of algorithms are you using? Uh, what are you? What technologies are you using? And I can't tell you that because that's proprietary. But what I can do is maybe something more suited to a conference. And together, let's build a hypothetical system uh, that I call the Simplified Weather Impairment Focused Reaction System, or SWIFR. Uh, and for those of you, oh, my head's in the way. For those of you who uh, have little kids, you'll probably get the joke of cleaning up lots of messes. So. Um, and after we build that, uh, we'll let the, of course, security engineers break it. And uh, we'll get to that very soon, I promise. So let's get into it. Um, the automated system we're going to design together is going to leverage the native feature of satellite diversity um, to avoid bad weather conditions where possible. To do this, we're going to use a basic architectural pattern for automated control called Sense Plan Act. The Sense component will build a perception of the signal environment along each candidate link vector. The plan component will decide whether to update the network topology or not. And the act component will update the system configuration to reflect the desired network topology. In more basic terms, we'll sense by identifying the set of links and their expected signal uh, strengths. We'll plan 
by identifying the link with the best signal strength. And if that link is not the current link, will act by instructing the terminal and satellites to switch their topology and use the link with the best SNR. <clears throat> All right, so let's engineer something. The first thing we need to do is sense the signal environment of the terminal relative to the satellite is currently connected to. For the current geometry, that's pretty straightforward. We can access telemetry from the terminal and that gives us a picture of how well the link is performing right now. We'll call this service the terminal telemetry service. So right there. For the geometries we aren't using, however, we need to build a forecast of achievable SNR values. So back to weather, as we now know, Weather is a dominant contributor to SNR in satellite communication networks, and there is a lot of literature on how to estimate weather and model its impacts on SNR. So we need a component that senses the weather or the local weather environment, and then uses that data to assemble predictions of the SNR along all the available link vectors. So we're gonna call out three additional services here. One, a weather forecasting service. Two, a link vector calculation service. And uh, this link vector calculation service will maintain a list of candidate link vectors based and using geometry and the relative positions of satellites and terminals. Uh, and three, an SNR prediction service uh, that uses the outputs of those previous uh, services to provide a holistic view of the available SNRs on any geometry. All right, so we've got the sensing component. There's a win. Next, we need to build our ACT component. To act on the distributed system, we define a system configuration service. So this above my head here. Um, and that will accept as an input, the link vector to be established between the terminal and satellite. And based on that input, it'll then compile and install that intent, instruct the network to adopt the new network topology. So finally, we need to put some planning logic to close the automation loop and connect the two. Now, being good system engineers, we don't wanna create unnecessary command and control traffic over the network. We probably wanna minimize contribution to state and distributed elements because that's a pain to manage. And we also acknowledge that there may be other system components or control systems that are gonna to wanna to call this system configuration service. So to address all these, we're going to use a pub sub pattern to broker the interaction between the sense and act blocks so that we only trigger instructions to the terminal and the satellites if change is required. Now, in order to generate pub sub events, we of course need a decision model. So how, why, when and why do we trigger uh, a message? We define this as follows. If there exists a candidate link vector with a better predicted SNR than the SNR of the current link, instruct the system to adopt that new best link vector. Otherwise, do nothing. Of course, this means we need a current link service, so something that can retrieve the current link vector, and a best link service, something that can select from all the possible links the one that's best performing. Okay, so basic system model, let's wire it up, add some final touches, then all the cyber guys can start to break it. So first, the sensing component, for terminal telemetry, we're going to pull this from our NMS. Uh, for weather forecasting, I really don't want to build that. So we're going to subscribe to something out of house, an external service, that one, broker it with an API gateway. And yeah, cyber guys, I know that that's really exciting. Um, for the link vector calculation, um, we need some basic orbit propagation that we pull from our flight dynamic system and the terminal location from the NMS. So we'll add those in. And then for SNR prediction, let's get creative. So this isn't a boring talk and we'll use maybe some machine learning or statistical learning algorithms. So for that, we're gonna need some training data. All right, now let's finish off the plan component. So we can use a rules engine pattern here, if we like that implements our basic decision model and a message queue for PubSub. So let's put those in. And then finally for the act component, okay, this is pretty straightforward. Let's just dump in an SDN controller and that will compile and install network intents. And uh, then we finish up all the wiring, check the arrows, and yeah, we've definitely closed the loop. So we can follow and trace a path from terminal all the way through the system back to the terminal. Okay, so now you're probably thinking, Donnie, this is fun. You played your little game, but seriously, when will you get to the point? And I'm almost there, I genuinely promise. Um, the title of this talk is Risks and Rewards in Automated Control Systems for Constellation Network Operations. So maybe we should roll up some of those rewards. The first reward I think is obvious. We set out with a design intent, um, a system that can react to weather impacts. And I think we've achieved that. This reactivity will help us deliver a higher quality of service to our customer by maximizing throughput of the communication link. We've effectively leveraged a native feature of NGSO systems, satellite diversity, to address what many consider an Achilles heel for, sat for SATCOM. I do wanna call out a second and perhaps not as obvious reward. Um, and that's this one. So the network folks here will notice that we've made the network even more dynamic by introducing new event paths that lead to network topology changes. For some, they'll say that's a bad thing. 
Um, but for me, I see this as actually enhancing our, our native moving target defense from a cybersecurity perspective. Moving target means that the value of the intelligence you obtain at one point is becomes less valuable over time because it stale dates. So I think now I'm probably getting the attention of the cyber guys in the room. So I don't know how much time we're in, maybe 10 minutes, two rewards, complete system design-ish, not too bad. Let's talk about risks. Okay. So at Telesat, we've invested significant time in making sure that our system architecture and design were right, including making sure that security was considered at each step of the design uh, journey. Now, clearly I'm not going to publicly disclose how exactly we secure our systems. I'm sure that somebody would come and talk to me afterwards. But I do want to do is demonstrate part of our approach to design and focus on modeling. So model-based engineering is central to our overall engineering approach at Telesat. Um, we use it all for all sorts of domains from system network and especially in security. And to show the multifaceted value of modeling, I wanna demonstrate how we can use a simple model to gain insight to uh, intended and unintended behaviors from a system perspective and also expose some potential risks from a security perspective. So the gatekeeper to our control system is this sensing component, um, which has the bulk of the services in it. Um, and at its core, the sensing component is that we designed is basically a binary classification algorithm that indicates if the current network topology is the best performing network topology. To understand the intended and unintended behavior of this component, we're gonna use a tool called a confusion matrix. And a confusion matrix, for those of you who don't know, is commonly used in machine learning to provide insight into the performance of classification algorithms. The basis of a confusion matrix is to place reality on one axis, so in this case, the top, and perception on the other axis. And reality is what is actually true. Um, so if it's raining, uh, there's actual water dropping on the ground. Um, perception is what the system predicts to be true based off of, of the sensory inputs that it has. So if I start spraying a hose at a window, a system might think it's raining, even if it's actually not. Um, for our confusion matrix, we can also establish from the intersections four different results and based on a fairly straightforward null hypothesis, the, that being the current link vector is better than all other candidate link vectors, we can group these results into the ones that are desirable, such as our true positive case, wherein the current link vector is indeed truly better than all other link vectors. The true negative case, uh, wherein there, there truly exists a candidate link vector that's better than the one we're on currently, but there's also some undesirable results. So there's the tr false positive case in which the current link vector is falsely identified as being better than all other candidate link vectors. And in statistics, we'll, we call this a type one error. And then the false negative case, in this case, there's a false perception that somehow out there, there exists a candidate link vector that is better than the current link vector. And this would be a type two error in statistics. From here, we can also establish a bunch of useful metrics of our classification algorithm, like accuracy, specificity, um, those sorts of things. But collectively, that gives us an uh, understanding of the quality of this system, like how well is it doing its job. The confusion matrix now, when paired with a behavioral model like MITRE ATT&CK, helps us build useful insights from a security perspective. So first, we should probably look at, again, those useful features of the system, the rewards we called out earlier, because in general, things that are, provide utility for us are targets for our adversaries. So let's consider maybe a threat actor who wants to degrade our moving target, native moving target defense, essentially improve the value of in the intelligence they gather over time by stabilizing the system. Now we understand from the confusion matrix and the decision model that false positives will cause the system to remain on its current link vector, essentially keep the same topology until some other external control algorithm that we're unaware of in our little system design uh, calls that system configuration service and changes things. Therefore, one possible tactic that an adversary might use is to impact the sensing component in order to increase the, increase the false positive error rate, thereby introducing that greater stability in the network topology. Now, using MITRE ATT&CK, we can also then call out some different techniques that an adversary might use to impact that system. And one of them maybe we could look at is data manipulation. So now we'll go back to our architectural model of the system, and we can identify different data interactions that an adversary can target to realize their objective. So maybe an adversary might target the external weather service um, from the top there in order to provide false data to the SNR estimation service. So imply that the weather is worth is, is terrible everywhere, so don't change anything. Um, an adversary might target the training data sets that are used to build the SNR prediction service and make it routinely underestimate SNR on links that are not the current link. 
Or an adversary could also maybe try and attack the terminal telemetry service and inject false telemetry that implies that uh, the current link is actually performing very well. Um, so un unbe the unbeatable link, so to speak. We could also consider a threat actor that wants to target the other reward, um, degrade the performance of our network. From the confusion matrix and decision model, we know that performance could be degraded if we increase the false negative error rate and cause the network to hop around a lot, right? Um, now, perhaps you're asking yourself, okay, um, you're focusing entirely on the sensing component here. You know, what about the decision model? What about the control algorithms? I mean, the sensing component is just the eyes, right? What about the brain? Um, and first off, I've got like, I don't know, five minutes or 10 minutes left, so we can't go into everything. But second off, and actually way more importantly, I wanna make an assertion here and then work through one last framework to, to support it. And the assertion is this, for all automated control systems, the sensing component, in other words, the way in which we perceive our reality is an inherent weakness. And that's the thing that we need to focus on. It should be designed with considered and intended and deliberate mindsets. So at Telesat, we've been working on um, a generic framework for assessing systems from a system quality and security perspective. Um, we currently call this the LMJ matrix because we literally have no other idea what to call it right now. Um, but basically on one axis, we classify the inputs to the system as true or false. That's the perception axis here. So intended or unintended. On the other axis, we classify the outputs or the yielded system behavior as intended or unintended. And from here, we can establish a basic taxonomy. So the first thing is um, intended behaviors that result from true inputs are what we call features. These are the correct system responses to true perceptions of the system environment or state. For the other three results, we label them as follows. Defects are unintended behaviors that arise from true inputs. I mean, this is classic software engineering, right? I designed it, I built it, I give in a proper input and something bad happens, right? That's a defect. Uh, vulnerabilities we call our unintended behavior that arise from false inputs. So somebody falsely represents an acceptable input in order to, to drive a defect in a particular way. Um, and inherent weaknesses are intended behaviors, things we want to happen when the system sees something, but they're arising from a false perception of that, that uh, event. From here, we'll establish our, what we use as one of our first axioms. And that is when we improve the, qual or the quality of our system design, let me try and move out of the slide here, uh, we minimize unintended behavior. Um, as with all axioms, this is like abundantly self-evident, but the thing about axioms is they're not often called out and it's useful to call that out and set a stage. Um, when we look specifically at automated control systems, however, we can further posit a second axiom. And that's that when we improve the accuracy of sensory systems, we minimize false inputs to, control, to the control systems that enact decisions. Now this framework provides us some guidance around best practice in, when introducing automation and network control. First, the only way we can reduce inherent weakness in our control systems is to improve the accuracy of our sensing components. These should therefore be an early focus in the design and modeling process because they establish the minimum possible risk profile of the overall system. It's, imp it's impossible to remove all false uh, inputs. And so what we want to create is high quality sensing component to minimize those inherent weaknesses. But second, we can see is that the overall greatest reduction in risk is actually found in maximizing the intended behaviors. And we can do this by minimizing defects and vulnerabilities. Now, this is fairly straightforward in the sense that we use design and modeling, or sorry, we use um, frameworks and we can avoid known anti-patterns, which is good design practice. And we can focus on testing efforts um, in a targeted way um, at bespoke implementations, which is good testing practice. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, and I'm told uh, by many people that it's good to provide a summary at the end of presentations like this to sync points home. So we are going to conduct a well-structured recap. So first, we established a problem that needed solving. Bad weather impacts satellite communication links. And we identified some native features of NGSO constellations, i.e. satellite diversity, that can be leveraged to help solve the problem. Next, we used the Sense Plan Act architectural pattern for automated control systems as a scaffold for a point solution to address our overarching need. And from there, we use more specific design patterns in the different blocks to fill in the scaffold and flesh of the solution architecture. We built an inventory of desirable features, um, improving the network performance and also an enhanced network topology dynamics. So we could infer possible targets of our adversaries, reminding that utility for us tends to be a target for people who don't like us. 
And we then built a confusion matrix to better understand the types of errors or quality of the, that the, of the sensing component and what they can introduce into the solution. We paired that confusion matrix with a behavioral model, MITRE ATT&CK, to build a simplified threat model based on standard tactics and techniques. And finally, we kind of showed um, how our new kind of framework, that's LMG matrix, and the associated taxonomy that we've built out of it uh, helps inform our guiding principles when designing for security and automated network control systems. Okay, lots of stuff there. What was the point? So here it is. We know that automated network control systems can yield a clear set of rewards for NGSO. Um, principally, automation in, uh, enables speed, complexity of operation, and scalability to a degree that humans just can't achieve. Um, and this will ultimately lead to higher quality of services to our customers. However, it is also clear that these same automated control systems that yield benefits introduce inherent weaknesses in system architectures, and these can only be mitigated through design best practice, thorough testing, um, which again, it's a bit of a tautology, but where do we target these best practices and testing with finite resources? Now, one other thing I think is useful is standards, frameworks, patterns, and models are force multipliers for engineering teams. In other words, an engineer armed with all of these items can do way more than an engineer without. Um, and this is true both from an architectural practice perspective, but also from the specific security practice perspective. The issue that we face is a lack of domain specific models and patterns. Um, and that leads to a higher testing burden and ultimately potential compliance risk. And I wanna close by saying it's this uh, paucity of models and patterns for NGSO that we are seeking to solve through a partnership uh, with Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And a bit of a shout out to the CyberC Lab, but in collaboration with them, we are aiming to develop an architectural meta model that supports compliance by design for NGSO operation segments and in particular, we've asked them to focus on the constituent automated control systems. Now, I'd love to talk way more about this, um, but I'm definitely out of minutes here. If you're interested in this work, feel free to contact me on the conference platform or at my email, which is on the next slide. And thank you kindly for your time and attention. And many thanks, uh, Matthew and the SISAT team for this opportunity to speak to you all today. I'm happy to tackle any questions if we have time left. Thank you, Adoni. We'll definitely uh, take the time to ask a couple of questions. Uh, wow, this is what I call a deep dive. Uh, <laughs> I'm still recovering. I did uh, take a lot of notes. Uh, thank you so much for the detailed presentation. Uh, let me start with this. Uh, would you agree that, uh, would you call your approach security by design? I think so. I think that we, uh, you know, it, one of the things that I think is really important is we've, we, we've always had a cybersecurity specification for our system. In fact, it leaves at the same level as our system specification. And for every requirement that we put in the system specification, we've evaluated from a cybersecurity um, compliance perspective. So we are definitely thinking security by design. Um, and in the overall program, we've taken it out of the system level and we're doing it at the segment levels as well. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned uh, and detailed very nicely the different threats that you considered uh, in, your, uh, in your architecture. Um, can you maybe go in slightly more details about these? Like I'm, thi I'm thinking about the, the threats related to the data sets that is uh, used to, uh, to feed the, the, um, the DSNR prediction uh, service. Uh, ca mm -hmm. Can you maybe detail a bit the, the, the couple of threats that you identified and also maybe couple it, th this was my next question about the security mechanism, maybe specifically that you, uh, you implemented to, uh, to address uh, these uh, threats. Yeah, so um, I'll first like reiterate that that system is a hypothetical system. Um, and so it's just something that we designed together. Um, that system has, that we just designed actually has a lot of limitations. I don't think you'd ever actually build something like that. But the point is, is that, um, the way we think about design is we pick patterns and frameworks because that tends to allow us um, as much as possible because it tends to allow us to um, then standardize uh, our attack surface, right? We can use uh, things like MITRE ATT&CK. Um, if we're using a pattern, a design pattern, right? That's commonly used in industry. We also can then get, figure out different uh, tactics and techniques to attack that pattern. And then we mm -hmm. start to mitigate from that perspective. So. To say that we, um, at this point right now, can say these specific tactics are useful against our system, like I definitely you know, don't want to talk about that. Um, but to say that there are patterns out there that are, native, are naturally more resilient to different types of techniques and tactics, that's what I think we focus on. So when we evaluate and do design, we look and say, 
What's the solution we want to solve? What patterns can we leverage to solve those? And then from a security perspective, what are the weaknesses in those patterns? And then we can start to look at mitigations. I mean, classically, the mitigations that you're going to use for operation segments, right, are mm -hmm. going to be the same that you use for other IT systems. I think the trick here is, and the what part of the thesis was is, scalability and automation is tending to rely on machine learning algorithms and these big data sets. And that's a fairly new uh, space. I mean, there was just an interesting article about OpenAI where they were able to spoof that data set by just putting human labels. So they tricked the AI system to think an Apple was an iPod by putting a label on it that said iPod, right? And like with 99% confidence, this AI was thinking this Apple was an iPod. That type of kind of hacking behavior, we don't have a lot of like experience in the wild to build a threat model against like MITRE ATT&CK. And that problem is an inherent weakness in control. As soon as you leverage these machine learning um, uh, sensing systems, if you will, those are inherent weaknesses. So how do you defend against that? The nice thing is the community is starting to build, I think, a better library, threat library uh, for ML. And one of the ones that I wanted to call it was this example of like poisoning uh, training data sets, right? Mm -hmm. If you can compromise the training data set, you can, inf you can influence the behavior of a machine learning algorithm in a way that's very, very, very hard to detect. So that means that when you think about the training data that you're using, you need to think about it in a much more privileged way than you might otherwise have thought. Typically the stuff like lives in R and D and like, you know, a lot of people have different accesses, but when you start to put these systems into production, right, in automated control, that training data is now becomes a crown jewel. You need to protect it mm -hmm. in, um, with a lot more uh, effort than you might otherwise have thought. Yeah, very clear. Also uh, very much related to uh, what we heard yesterday from uh, Akash Patel uh, from Microsoft. Uh, mm -hmm. showing the impact of uh, very tiny changes in the data set feeding the ML model, uh, having dr dramatic impact on the results. Uh, it was showing the trajectories of hurricanes uh, completely off by slightly influencing the, the inputs of the, of the model. Um, I have mm -hmm. one last question and then we'll look up. I think there is uh, at least one in the chat. Um, how would you accommodate um, in terms of agility for the next generation of the products or to accommodate with the next generation of the satellites that, that will be flying. How would you deal with that? Um, so if I think I understand correctly is, you know, we're building systems and satellite tends to build point solutions for their existing generation of spacecraft and then you got the next one, but the operation segment's gonna persist. So you wanna make sure that you can either flexibly accommodate these new generations or extend your current solution to accommodate. Is that, is that a good interpretation of what you're asking? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to kind of ring the patterns bell again. Right. Um, so modern IT, I think is built around increasingly um, abstraction levels, ex increasing levels of abstraction. And that's a, that's the gateway to flexibility and extensibility. And it's true in satellite uh, as, as with any other system. Um, one, like one kind of shout out is it, you know, our problems are very similar to other industries. Like take a look at Uber, for example, Uber has a tasking problem. They have a set of customers that are in motion geospatially. They have a set of resources, their, their cars or their drivers, right? That come all offline and offline in unpredictable ways. And they need to map those resources to those consumers, right? Very big problem set. They've done some great work in looking at that kind of generic problem, right? Um, and building tools that allow them to be future thinking about their business. Well, that's, an, that's, that's fundamentally, there's an abstraction there that says there's a primitive problem that we need to solve. And it doesn't matter if we're using this type of satellite or that type of satellite, the primitive problem is I need to, I eventually need to connect a satellite to a user. So let's build something generic enough to attack that. Mm -hmm. And then through config or like the, you know, um, feature, uh, feature flags or whatever, address, right, the, the specific constraints for Gen 1 versus Gen 1.5 or Gen 2. Yeah, very clear. Okay. Um, I don't know, Patrick, if you have a question. No. There is, I'll take the, the one from the chat. Yep. Um, this, is, this is the question. How might formal methods fall into your approach? S sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> it's pretty short. Uh, how might formal methods fall into your approach? Formal methods, yep. right. Um, so I think, uh, so in these large scale programs, they tend to be a waterfall. And then when we hit software, we tend to want to be a bit more agile, but you got to find a, a kind of middle ground. Mm -hmm. um, so we have embarked using formal methods to define our specifications, right? So um, we go through the process. And so, like I mentioned, we at the system level, we have a system cybersecurity specification that holds prime place at the system tier in terms of our flow down of requirements. Um, and the development of that cybersecurity um, specification 
was um, more formal than what I've shown here. What I think I was trying to call out here is that the formal methods tend to rely on models and patterns and frameworks that, and libraries of patterns and frameworks that exist in industry. And the issue that we face is this lack of, the, of models specific to entry so, so domain specific models and, and libraries. And we need to build that. Um, and then we can leverage that um, in these formal methodologies and um, make them more efficient. Otherwise, we end up with uh, difficulty and kind of getting good coverage. Um, so that's, but it, it does kind of play a role. It's yep. more at the system level than in the implementation tier, but it's gatekeeped by a library of, um, a domain specific library that just doesn't exist. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Danny. And I couldn't resist, uh, I don't know, are you a Sense fan? <laughs> no, but uh, I'm, I'm an Oilers fan. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> uh, I just looked but, up the, the current ranking and I couldn't believe my eyes. The Leafs are leading? They, they are indeed. They are indeed. <laughs> Much to the chagrin of most of Canada, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, Ottawa is not doing so well. Uh, seventh no, place. they are not. Uh, too All bad. Right. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, Danny, for, uh, for joining SciSat uh, first edition. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I think uh, we all appreciated your, uh, your presentation. Thank you for being uh, with us uh, today. Well, thank you very much, Mathieu, and thank you again, everyone, for uh, putting up with me and, uh, and going <laughs> on that little journey. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, uh, Donnie. Bye-bye.